Okay, and the first thing I want to explain to you is your binder. Okay, so this is cool. Praise the Lord. There's way more people here tonight than we were anticipating. Okay, and so if you are planning to come back throughout the summer, we will get you a binder. Okay, so just make sure that you let my wife know at the end of tonight, and then we'll get you a binder for next week. Okay, but don't worry. I have all the papers that you need for tonight already, so I'll be able to give you that for tonight, and then we can get you a binder later. So if you open up your binder. Good. All right, good. You'll see a beautiful color-coded table of contents, okay? And so how the summer is gonna work is we're gonna study kind of eight different topics, okay? So you can see them all right there. And so what we're gonna call them is themes for the week. So every week there's gonna be a theme, and this week the theme is abiding in Christ. Okay, so if you flip that very first tab, that number one, what you'll find, and this is the same format for the rest of the binder, okay, is there's devotionals, that go along with the theme of the week for the whole summer. So for this whole week, there's devotionals that go along with abiding in Christ. For week two, there will be devotionals going along with union with Christ. Week three, a lordship, fighting sin, world missions, all of that. So there's devotionals for you to follow along throughout the week. Um, and then you guys can even talk about it with one another throughout the week. At the end of the devotional, so if you flip over a couple pages, every week has an article that goes along with the theme for the week. So we wanted to load you guys up with a bunch of homework since you're not in school. I'm just kidding, it's not homework, okay? It's not homework. My man in the back is just, I'm loving it, okay? So much emotion. Uh, <laughs> all right, it's not homework, uh, but we wanted to provide you with additional material since we're only meeting once a week. If you're like, man, I really wanna keep learning about this. So there's articles every single week going along with the theme, okay? And then in addition, if you flip over all the way to, so that's the same pattern, one through eight. You go all the way to nine. Okay, you go all the way to nine. This is called the word training tab. Okay, so we're gonna do tons of stuff learning how to study God's word this summer. And there's all sorts of resources, all sorts of tools in the word training tab. And you can jump ahead if you want to, but almost all of this will cover throughout the summer. Okay, we'll cover this stuff throughout the summer, so don't stress about it. Uh, I'll like randomly be like, hey, go to your word training tab and pull this out. If you go to number 10, that's same thing, but for evangelism. So we'll cover a lot of different ways to share your faith, how to lead a Bible study, how to start conversations with people about the gospel. And then tab 11 is just additional resources. There's some things in there about prayer. If I give you extra articles or things like that as we go throughout the summer. Okay, so this binder is your life source. Don't lose it. You should have a name tag on it. If you don't have a name tag on it, get one after this. Okay, because they all basically look the same except mine because it's blue. Who has the other blue one? Way to go, Grace. All right, we have the only two blue ones. Walmart ran out of binders. All right, these guys are going to be passing out uh, some outlines. And so we are going to be looking at, if you have your Bibles, John 15. John 15. There's two things you're going to, three things you're going to need every week. Your binder, a pen, and a Bible. Okay, a binder, your binder, not any binder, your binder, a Bible, and a pen. Thankfully, there's a couple extra Bibles on some of these tables if you need one. Uh, you can just pull it up on your phone, whatever you need to do. Um, but we're passing out outlines. And then usually what you do is you just take it and then you put the outline for the week into the slot. So you'd put it in the first week and the next week's in week two. You guys get it, okay? So as they pass that out, if you open up to John 15... And after I get done speaking, there'll be a bathroom break, okay? So if you're anything like me on a summer project, I'm always thinking, when's the bathroom break? And it's after this, okay? So just hold it, all right? No matter how long I go, okay? So just hold it, and then afterwards, the, that's you too, Dylan. Don't you dare get up and go to the bathroom during this. Um, everybody got one? We good to go? I think we had enough copies, and if not, I'm sorry. All right, so we're gonna be looking tonight primarily at what does it mean to abide in Christ, okay? We're gonna look at mostly John 15, verses four and five, but we'll be referencing all the way up to verse 11. And so let me just read John chapter 15, four through 11 for us. This is Jesus speaking. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and uh, thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Okay, let me, let me pray before we unpack God's word. Father, we pray that tonight that we would see King Jesus high and lifted up, that we would see the importance of abiding with Christ for the rest of our lives. I pray that the men and women in this room would leave tonight with a newfound conviction or maybe for the first time realizing how important it is to abide in Christ and that they would make it a priority. Father, that one day when the men and women in this room have families, Father, that their top priority would be to abide with Jesus. So God, we we know that only you can do that, Father. We know that only you can produce the fruit, only you can grow people into the image of Christ. And so we pray that we would you would do that as we expound upon your word tonight. We pray that you would help us to listen well, Father, to take notes, Father, and to um, God just on all, just to give our full attention to your word because you're worthy, Father. I am nobody, Father. I pray that you would help me to just get out of the way, Father, and that the attention would all be on Jesus and on His word. So Christ, we love you and pray this in your name. Amen. All right, whoopsie, I'm bad at slides, so if at any point you're like, maybe there should be a next slide, just be like, Aaron, maybe there should be another slide. So there was the verses, okay? All right, there's our son. This is Oliver. I said I would show you to him. That's Oliver. On the left, that's at the UIS baseball game. Uh, that was right after Austin caught. Over here, he plays baseball. U.S. the best fly ball Oliver has ever seen. And <laughs> Oliver would not, he just wouldn't stop talking about it. I mean, he only says like, dad, dad, in truck, but he was just like, that catch was amazing, Dad. And so, uh, just kidding. And then that's him doing his real favorite activity. It wasn't UIS baseball, it's eating. Um, and so that's him doing his favorite activity. Um, but that's our son, Oliver. But Oliver didn't always used to look like this, okay? This is what Oliver used to look like, like that, okay? That's what he looked like. Do you see this, the resemblance? I can't at all, okay? It just looks like a baby. If you would just put any ultrasound up there, I'd be like, yep, that's my son, okay? I would have no idea, except that it has his name on it, and that's about it, uh, or Alana's name on it. But this is him. Me and Alana frequently talk about how crazy it is that at one point he was in her stomach, uh, because it just he's just huge now, right? He's just literally like half her height already. She's only like 5'2". And so uh, we're just like, can't believe that at one point Oliver fit in her womb. But as, as I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about babies in the womb, it's kind of incredible because they're literally dependent upon their mother for life. But they don't do anything. Like, and Oliver barely does anything now, right? But back then, he really didn't do anything. All he did, the only way he lived, was because he was attached to Alana. He was attached to Alana. His life source was Alana in the womb. If he was not attached to Alana in the womb, if the umbilical cord would have broke or there would have been some kind of thing like that, he wouldn't have been able to grow. He wouldn't have been able to develop. In, in all reality, he probably would have died. But because he was attached to his mother, he lived. And in a much similar, more important way, Christ is our life source, is what the scriptures teach. Jesus Christ is what gives Christians life. And if we are not attached to him, if we do not abide in him, we can't grow. We can't develop. And ultimately, if we're really not attached to him, we will die. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to try to, I'm going to try to convince you that abiding in Christ is essential to life. That abiding in Christ is essential to life. And the way we're going to do that is we are going to look at two requirements to grow in your walk with God. Okay, two requirements to grow in your walk with God. This is what I love about Christianity. These guys know it because they come to my house for Bible study. I say this all the time. My favorite thing about Christianity is it's honestly pretty simple. Okay, and I love that because I'm a simple guy and I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Okay, Um, yes, there's plenty of things in scripture that's like, hey, that's a little complicated. But what we need to know is pretty simple. And I really believe there's only two things, two requirements to grow spiritually. And here's the first one. Jesus must abide in me. Jesus must 
abide in me. And I, I use me, I, all throughout this because I'm talking to myself. I'm not talking to you guys. I need this reminder, and I've been convicted as I've been preparing for this. Um, and so this is for me as well, not just you. But Jesus must abide in me. Look at me again at verse 4 and 5. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay. In the first four verses, verses four through seven, the word abide shows up seven times. Okay, and some couple other times throughout the passage as well. But in verses four through seven, the word abide shows up seven times. In the Bible, any time a word repeats itself a lot, it's trying to emphasize importance. Okay, back then they didn't have exclamation points or emojis or anything like that. Okay, and so the way that they emphasized importance was by repeating themselves. For example, in John 3, 3, Jesus said, Truly, truly, uh, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, Jesus didn't stutter, right? He didn't just accidentally say truly twice. That's kind of what I thought when I first started reading the Bible. I was like, why did he do that? Or it was like a typo. No, he, he was trying to get their attention. He was trying to say, this is important. And what he, was, he was talking to Nicodemus. A lot of you are probably familiar with John chapter 3. And he was telling him about how to get into heaven. That's really important. That's like the most important thing you could know is how do I know if I'm going to get into heaven? And so he said, truly, truly, like, listen up. In, this, in these four verses, Jesus says, abide seven times. What do you think Jesus is trying to get across to us that's important? To abide. To abide. Right? Again, I, I'm going to do stuff like that, okay? So just feel free to shout out, okay? To abide. It's clearly what he's getting after here. So what does it mean? What does it mean to abide? The original Greek word, can't pronounce it, won't even try. Okay, what it means is to remain in, but really another translation that I really like that just kind of helps me picture it, it means to make my home in. What it means to abide is to make your home in, right? Like where do I abide? It's where I live, it's where I go to for comfort. It's where I go to for rest. It's where I've made my home. That's where I abide. And in verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, Whoever abides in me and I in him. Okay, so in a second, we're going to talk about what does it look like for us to abide in Christ. But before we get there, before that's even possible, we have to make sure that Christ abides in us. Okay, so he says, I in, or whoever abides in me and I in him. And so the question we're going to ask tonight is, how do we know if Christ really abides in me? How do I know? How do I know for sure that Christ really abides in me? Because if he doesn't, you can't grow spiritually. It's literally not possible. There's one of the two requirements. Okay, so how do we know? And we're going to look at three tests. Okay, three tests to know if, you, if Christ abides in you. And the first one is this, and this should all be on your outline. I remembered the slide. There it is. First one. I've acknowledged that I have sinned against God and deserved death. So by test, I mean if we get done with all three of these and I explain them and you're like, yeah, I agree with all of that. I believe all of that. Then Christ more than likely probably does abide in you. Uh, and if he doesn't or you're questioning that, feel free to talk to me or my wife after this. Nothing is more important to us than to know for sure that Christ abides in you guys. But the first test is this, that I have acknowledged that I have sinned against God and deserve death. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Okay, so as we're going to see as tonight progresses... The branches that do abide in Christ, they grow and they flourish and they, uh, and they bear fruit. But those who do not have Christ abiding in them, the branches that are not attached to the vine, this verse says, will be thrown into the fire and burned. Okay, that, again, that's pretty strong language, but I think Jesus is trying to really get our attention here. Okay, so what does he mean by that? What does he mean? Well, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, mankind has been cursed by sin. Okay, so everybody you want to like keep your thumb there or whatever you want to do, but we're going to flip over to Ephesians 2 for a little bit. Ephesians 2 starting in verse 1.
says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sun to disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Okay? So we can spend all, we spend all of tonight unpacking that passage, okay? But we're not. I'm just going to give you the kind of the summary. What is this? What is this passage teaching us? Okay. First of all, that we have all sinned against God. Another verse for that is Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person, every one of us, have sinned against God. Okay? I don't have to ask you to do this because I, I know what the result would be if I said, who thinks they've never sinned before in their whole life? I've done this a long time. No one's ever raised their hand. Right? Or if they did, they'd be lying and they just sinned for the first time right there. Okay? And so everyone has sinned against a holy God. It's also teaching us that there's a penalty for our sin and that penalty is death. Romans 6.23, the first half says, for the wages of sin is death. In short, uh, by the end of the summer, I promise you this, if you come for all eight weeks, Romans 6.23 will literally be ingrained in the back of your brain, okay? So, but we'll get to it later, more in depth. It's like literally by far my favorite verse in the Bible. I've said this a lot. If I could only take one verse and I was stranded on an island forever, it would be Romans 6.23, okay? But the first half of it says, for the wages of sin is death, which means what we have earned because we have sinned against God is death. And not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. We actually deserve to be separated from God for all of eternity in a place called hell because we've sinned against God. That's what we deserve because of our sin. And then third, this passage teaches us that everyone is born spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. The reason I highlight that one is, is because I always ask the question to people, what can a dead person do? What do you guys think a dead person can do? Nothing, okay? Again, just he hear me out. I'm never going to ask a hard question, okay? Like, I don't know if I could answer it, okay? It's all, if it's, you're like, that sounds too obvious, that's the answer, okay? A dead person can do nothing, absolutely nothing. So why would the Bible say that we're dead in our sin? It's trying to help us understand that we can't do anything in our own effort to save ourselves. That because we've sinned against God and because He's holy, because He's perfect, because He's just, we can't earn our way back to Him because we've sinned. And so we are dead. We're helpless. We can't do anything to get back to God. That's what this passage is teaching, okay? So the first test to know if Christ abides in you is that you've acknowledged that everything we just covered is true. Okay, this is hard. This is hard stuff, okay? I promise you I'm about to get to the best news on planet Earth, okay? But the only reason it's the best news on planet Earth is because of what we just covered, because there's really bad news. And the really bad news is that we've sinned and we've sinned against God and we deserve death. But if we haven't acknowledged that, if we think that we're good people and that we're gonna get into heaven just because we're good people, the reality is we've all sinned. And that makes us not good people. Yeah, I'm, I might be better than Matt, right? Probably not, but I might be, I don't know. We could talk about it later, okay, right? But that's comparing myself to the wrong standard. Matt's not the standard of who gets into heaven or not, even though Matt's a great guy. God is the standard of who gets into heaven or not, and he's perfect and holy. Anybody remember what happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? Can someone tell me? What happened? Yeah. They were kicked out. That's exactly right. They were kicked out of the garden. Let me ask you this. Why? Anybody? God can't fellowship with sin. That's right. God cannot fellowship with imperfect people because he's holy because he's perfect. He cannot be in the presence of imperfect people. So he kicked them out of the garden. All they did was sin one time and they got kicked out of the garden. And me and you have sinned far more than one time, right? And so we deserve death. That's the first requirement, but there is great news and it's right here. Here's the second test. By faith, I've trusted in Christ alone for salvation and eternal life. By faith, I've trusted in Christ alone for salvation and eternal life. The good news is that even though, check this out, even though God would have been perfectly just and still good to leave us dead in our sin because we rebelled against him, he loves us so much that he actually offers us a free gift of salvation. Check it out. Ephesians 2, stay there. Verse 4. 
but God, okay? I always was told this is the biggest but in the Bible, okay? Biggest but in the Bible. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What is this saying? It's saying that even though we're dead in our sin by nature, even though every single one of us, even our beautiful little baby boy, Oliver, okay? He's a little sinner, all right? I know that. Come hang out with them for a little bit, okay? And so that's my, it's always my go-to when people are like, well, like, you know, like babies aren't, you know, they don't sin. It's like, have you ever met a baby, right? It's like, have you ever seen a two-year-old walk up to another two-year-old? So it's like if Oliver, he's not two yet, but he goes in the nursery, some kid brought a toy. Oliver, I have no doubt, she's gonna walk right over to grab it and yell, mine, take it away. One, it's not his, okay? Two, who in the world taught him that? I can promise you this, me and Alana aren't at home taking stuff out of each other's hands, yelling mine, okay? I, he's never seen that before in his life. But it's because he has a sin nature because of the curse of sin. But God has offered us a solution and the solution is Jesus Christ. So how can we sinful human beings be made right with the holy God? Through Jesus is what verse four and five says. And what did Jesus do? He came to this earth he humbled himself, left heaven, came to this earth. He took on human flesh, and he was tempted in every single way that we were tempted. A passage that really helps me with this, because sometimes it's hard for me to like think like he was really tempted like we were. In Matthew chapter 4, Satan tempted Jesus, and he literally said, I'll give you the whole world. Okay, I don't know about you guys. I've never been offered that. Okay, I've never been offered, hey, just don't follow God, and you can have everything. Like the little whole world, you can have it all. He was tempted in every single way, and maybe even more than we were, and yet the Bible says he did not sin. He perfectly obeyed the Father, and he fulfilled the requirements of the law that you and I could never fulfill. But instead of going to heaven like he rightfully deserved, he went to the cross, and on that cross he actually bore my sin. He bore your sin. He paid for it in full on the cross, the Bible says. Yes, he was beaten, he was scourged, he had a, thrown, uh, a crown of thorns shoved into his head. Yes, that's horrible. I can't even imagine that. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was he actually experienced the full wrath of God. That he drank the cup of wrath is what the Bible says. And what he drank was my sin. He drank your guys' sin. He paid for it on our behalf. Why? Because he loves us. That doesn't make any sense to me, right? I don't, I don't know about you, but it's just like when I, if I, with, for Jack just for our whole relationship, just spat in his face and just walked away. I'm not sure that I would lay down my life for him. Okay, actually I know I wouldn't. Okay, let's just be honest, right? Or I don't know, how, that was backwards. I, he wouldn't lay his life down for me. I'm sure of that in that scenario. But God, in ways we can't understand because of his great love for us, died in our place. Literally took the penalty that we deserve. Look at verse eight in Ephesians two. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. God offers us a completely free gift, okay? What makes a gift a gift is that it's free, okay? I know that sounds simple, right? But if I pay for a gift in any way, shape, or form, it's no longer a gift, it's a payment, right? And so he's saying in Ephesians chapter two that Jesus offers us a free gift, what does that mean? That means we can't earn it. That means we can't do anything for it. That means there's no amount of good deeds, there's no amount of uh, good works that we could say, here, Jesus, here's my good works, now will you let me in? No, we have to accept it as a gift, as a free gift, purely out of his love for us. But how do we do that? How do we accept a free gift of salvation that we can't see, we can't touch, it's not in this room? The Bible says what we need to do is repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, 15. Mark 1, 15, this is Jesus. He said, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. To repent means to turn around. Um, it's an old military term. It literally means to do an about face, which means if I'm walking this way and I'm marching and there's a commander and he yelled repent, I would turn around and walk in the exact opposite direction. That's what the word repent means. And really it starts with, it, what it really means is to change your mind, 
to change the way that you're thinking, to, to stop trusting in yourself and being a good enough person to get into heaven or stop believing that God's not real or stop believing that X, Y, and Z thing and to trust in the biblical gospel, which is that Christ came, died in our place and offers me a free gift of salvation that I could never earn. And that's the only way that I could get into heaven. That's what it means to repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel means good news. And the good news is that even though we were dead in our sin, Christ came and died in our place because he loves us and offers us a free gift of salvation that we do not deserve and could never earn, could never repay, but he offers it to us because he loves us. And when we accept that free gift, when we repent for the first time, when we surrender our life to Christ, what happens is 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says we become new creations in Christ. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're a new person. What that means is God takes out your heart that has been dead in sin and gives you the Holy Spirit. He actually comes and dwells inside of you. Christ literally abides in you through the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ. If you've really repented and trusted in Christ, he dwells inside of you. So the second test for if Christ abides in you is that you've turned away from trusting in yourself for salvation. And by faith, you've trusted in Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection on your behalf. The third test, third and final test, is that my life shows evidence of repentance and bearing fruit. My life shows evidence of repentance and bearing fruit. All right, we're done with Ephesians 2. Go back to John 15. Check out verse 8 with me. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Okay? Prove to be my disciples. He's not saying that you earn being a disciple, but he's saying that your life will show or reveal if you really are a disciple of Christ. We'll look at what it means to bear fruit here in a second, but really what I we're trying to get out here is this. There has to be evidence. There has to be some tangible fruit, some, some revealing of your life that shows that your repentance is really genuine and that Christ really abides in you. There is no such thing, doesn't exist, as a fruitless Christian. It's not possible. If you are a fruitless Christian, I love you with my whole heart, Christ probably doesn't abide in you, right? And we'll cover what it means to bear fruit in a little bit, okay? But there's no such thing, because Jesus promises, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear fruit, right? That's a promise. So your life will begin to change. You will uh, be begin to become more and more like Jesus after you become a Christian, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. I, I, I'm, I am the least perfect person in this entire room. I promise you I sin more than anybody in this whole room because I know myself, okay? I'm not perfect. But my life is progressively becoming more and more like Jesus Christ and less and less like the world, less and less going after sin, right? My life is showing that I'm bearing fruit, and it's not me. We'll see that in a second. It's Christ. The question you can ask is what is your attitude towards sin? Are you okay with sin in your life? Do you tolerate it? Do you think it's not that bad? Or are you progressively, consistently trying to turn away from sin and to run to Christ? Those are kind of some, some ways to know, how do I really know if there's evidence in my life? I really like this illustration. This really helped me, okay? Show of hands, who knows who LeBron James is? Okay, praise God, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, so he's not the greatest basketball player of all time. You can fight me later. Michael Jordan is. Um, but I didn't know if everyone would know who Michael. Does everybody know who Michael Jordan is? Raise your hand. Okay, well, just all right. I just don't know. All right. Um, so imagine for a second if we could take the spirit, the desires, the will, the drive, the ambitions, the thoughts of LeBron James, take them out of his body, and put them inside of me, Aaron. Okay. That'd be sick, all right? So if that happened, okay, what do you think would change about my life? I want answers. Okay, I would probably play a lot more basketball. Absolutely. What else? My time would change, right? I could promise you this. I wouldn't be here. I can't imagine this is what he's doing right now, okay? What else? 
That's probably true, right? Well, I don't know. I'm pretty prideful, but we'll see. Um, yeah, but probably. You're right, okay? Uh, LeBron James, he loves Taco Tuesday, okay? I'd probably love Taco Tuesday, right? I'd probably really care that my son Brony is trying to get into the NBA, but he sucks, okay? But he's just capitalizing on his dad's name, all right? right? But I would really care about that, okay? I'd really care about that, okay? When LeBron James' spirit comes inside of me, what would go away would be Aaron's old desires, wants, wills, and it would be replaced, replaced with LeBron James' desires, and then it would be evident in the way that I began to spend my time, how I conducted myself, what I did with my life, what I cared about. And in the same way, if Christ really abides in you, if the Holy Spirit really abides in you, your life will change. Your desires, again, not instantaneously, not perfectly, but your desires will begin to shift from wanting to live for yourself, live for what you used to live for, to wanting to live for Jesus, to become more like Jesus, to care about the things that Jesus cares about, and to care less and less about the things that I care about and the things that the world cares about. Why? Because I literally have this Holy Spirit living inside of me if Christ really abides in me, and my desires will change, okay? So to review the three tests, how do I know if Christ abides in me? I've acknowledged that I've sinned against God and deserve death. By faith, I've trusted in Christ alone for salvation and eternal life, and my life shows evidence of repentance and bearing fruit. Does Christ really abide in you? Okay, this is literally the most important question you could ever ask. Same thing with Nicodemus. How do I, how do I get into heaven? Is essentially the question, right? It's the most important question you can ask. And if anyone in this room isn't sure, please, 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 please talk to me. Please talk to my wife. We would love to talk to you about that. But if you do think, man, I, I do think Christ abides in me, not in a prideful way, but just I think these things are true in my life and Christ has changed me and I see what he's done for me on the cross and I'm trying to live for him now as a free gift, right? Then what we are to do as believers is we are to now abide back in him, okay? So that's my second, here, that was the first requirement, okay? First requirement to grow spiritually is to, that Christ has to abide in me. The second requirement is this, I must abide in Christ, Okay? Here's the cool thing. Jesus said this, not me. Okay, this is really simple, right? He just lays it out there. This is it, right? Christ has to abide in me, and I have to abide in Christ. Look back at verse 4 and 5 again with me. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. We'll stop there, okay? It's very possible as believers to have seasons of our lives where we're, we're not doing a good job of abiding in Christ. Let's just be honest. Okay, it's very possible to have seasons of your life where you're not doing a good job of abiding in Christ, but Christ really does abide in you. And so what we're going to look at is what happens if we don't abide in Christ as believers, and then we'll look at what does happen if we do abide in Christ as believers. But first, what happens if we don't? What I just read in verse 4, it says the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Okay, I know nothing about gardening whatsoever, Okay, but I understand the vine and the branches, because I had to research it, okay? The vine, right? I mean, you think I'm kidding. I really had to research it. Like, I didn't know, okay? The vine is the life source, correct? Right? Is the branch the life source? No, the vine is the, the life source, okay? The branch cannot produce anything by itself. It just can't. The vine is the one that produces fruit. The, the vine is the one that causes the branch to grow and flourish. The, brine, the branch is just a branch. It's just chilling, okay? It just holds the fruit, right? I don't really know what a branch does. It's not an animate thing, okay? Right? But the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. And Jesus is saying, neither can we spiritually. It is not possible, not possible to grow spiritually apart from abiding in Christ. It's not possible is what Jesus is saying. Just as impossible it would be to cut off a branch from a tree and expect that that branch is going to keep growing. That's how impossible it is for us to abide, or grow spiritually if we're not abiding in Christ. If we look at verse 5, what does Jesus say we can accomplish apart from him in verse 5? Someone tell me. Nothing, okay? Are you sure it doesn't say we can't accomplish most things or some things? or a few things. Oh, it says we can't accomplish anything. Oh, it says nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears my truth. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is not saying here that you can't physically do anything. Okay, 
We know that's true because there's all sorts of people all over the world that don't believe in Christ and they do things. Okay, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about spiritually. He's talking about we can't grow. We can't accomplish anything worthwhile. We can't accomplish anything for the kingdom of God. We can't grow spiritually apart from abiding in Jesus. There is nothing of spiritual, eternal, and lasting value that we can accomplish in our own effort and strength. This was really humbling for me. I, I heard this on one, a summer project like this that I was on way back in 2015. But some of the most famous people in world history usually get forgotten at some point, right? Usually. Now, there's some people, right? There's some people that have made it for, you know, since the beginning of time, but there's very few. You could accomplish, you could be a billionaire, and there's a good chance that people won't remember you three generations from now. The way we know that is, does anybody in here know their great-great-grandpa's name? I don't, right? It's like, I don't even know if I had a great-great-grandpa. I'm just kidding. That's, I would have to, okay, right? <laughs> but I definitely don't know his name. I don't know what he did. I don't know. I don't, he could have been a billionaire. I have no idea. If, if he was, I don't know why he didn't pass down some money, right? But I have no idea, right? We'll all be forgotten. But if we want our lives to count, if we want our lives to make a difference for all of eternity, we have to abide in Jesus because it's saying we can do nothing apart from him, nothing apart from Christ. On the other hand, let's look at the positive side. So what can we do if we abide in Christ or what will happen if we abide in Christ? It says we will bear fruit, okay? It actually says we'll bear much fruit. So naturally, here it is. What's the question? What does it mean to bear fruit? Okay, um, a lot of people are kind of all over the place with this. I think my best interpretation of what he means by bearing fruit is he's referring to the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, so in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, I'll read it. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Okay. Now, when I first became a Christian and I read this, I was hoping for something a little more exciting. Okay, I'll just be honest, right? But think about it. Who doesn't want joy? I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone on the planet that's like, yeah, I just don't want to be happy. Like, I just don't want to be joy. I just want to be miserable. That's what I want with my life, okay? And you've probably met some people like that, but they don't really want that, okay? They've just given in, right? They, everyone wants joy. What about to have peace? to not be rattled by life circumstances, just to be content and happy no matter what goes on in your life. Who doesn't want that, right? Who doesn't want to be known as someone who's kind? Who wants to be known as the guy that's always rude to everybody, right? Who, who doesn't want to have self-control and to be faithful and to be good and to be gentle? Jesus clearly says that apart from me, you actually really can't do any of those things. It's not saying that you can't, okay, all the time or sometimes, but it's not lasting and it's not really real, okay? Alana's dad is one of the nicest people I know on planet Earth. He's not a believer, okay? But his source, where he's getting that from is just his own motivation to wanna do that. If tomorrow he decided to change, he just would. But if we're in Christ and we're abiding in him, God will produce these things in us. I can tell you this, I was talking with Alana not that long ago, because I was looking at the fruits of the Spirit, and I was like, man, I feel like I still struggle with a lot of these things. Like, am I even a Christian? Like, I have this, we just talk about things like this, okay? That'd be a problem. We figured out I was. And so, <laughs> as I was going through this, though, I was like, man, like, when I first came to Christ, it is night and day difference how much more loving I am than when I first came to Christ. It is night and day difference how much more joyful I am, how much more peace I have, how much more patient and kind I am, right? It's like, I mean, every other word out of my mouth was a cuss word when I came to Christ, right? Like I never read a Bible. Like I was constantly talking bad about people. I had no lasting joy. I was living for the things of this world. And that God has progressively borne fruit in my life. So it's not saying you're gonna be perfect. It's not saying you're gonna have all of these things instantaneously, but God will begin to grow you in these things. And that's an evidence that Christ really does abide in you but you also have to abide in him. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what the heck does that mean? How do we do that? How do we abide in Christ? Okay, I don't really understand how Christ abides in us either. He just does it. He just comes inside of us and then he just starts changing stuff, okay, right? But how do we abide in Christ is the question. Verse 10 of John 15. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept um, my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Okay, so two things. Two things of how we abide in Christ. We abide in His love and we obey His commandments. How do we abide in Christ? How do we grow spiritually? We abide in His love and we obey His commandments. Okay? What does it mean to abide in His love? Okay? Abide means, again, to make my home in. So how do I abide in the love of God? I make my home there. I constantly remind myself of the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done for me. I constantly remind myself and pray and thank God that He would save a sinner like me. I'm constantly around people. I'm constantly around believers who are reminding me of the good news of the gospel, that God loves me so much that he sent Jesus to die for me. That's how you abide in Christ. You remind yourself as constantly as you can of the love of God shown to you in Christ. And then you trust him. But let's look at verse nine. I actually, I don't want to skip this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible constantly gets skipped over, literally should blow your mind. Okay, verse nine. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Okay, who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, Jesus just said, as the Father has loved me. So would anybody like be like, yeah, it's probably a lot, right? How much God the Father loves Jesus Christ, right? You all on board with that? How much he loves him? Okay, then he says, so have I also loved you. What? The same way that God the Father loves Jesus Christ is the way that Jesus loves me? Does he know me? Right? Like, has he seen my sin? The answer is he has, but he paid for it on the cross. What ridiculous love that God would love me that much. It's like, yeah, like, love me like a little. That would make sense. I, and still probably not, Right? But as much as the Father loves the Son, that's ridiculous. And that's, how, that's what we need to remind ourselves of and constantly focus on. But secondly, we need to keep His commandments. We abide in Jesus by trusting Him and obeying Him in our daily lives and trusting that as we do that, He will bear fruit in us. That, that He will produce joy and peace and love and patience in our life as we trust Him and obey Him in our lives. Let me give you four really practical ways that you can do this, okay? And we're gonna cover this more after the, the potty break, okay? Uh, in, on the whiteboard uh, with a little diagram, okay? But just, I'm gonna, so we're not gonna go too in detail is the point here. First one is this, get in the word. Get in the word. Verse seven of John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, do, are you hearing from Christ? Are you going to the Word? God has literally given us a love letter. He's literally given us everything that we need to know this side of eternity here in this book, and He wrote it to us for our benefit, so that way we would grow. Get in the Word. Study the Word. That's how you abide in Christ. Secondly, pray. That's how we talk to Him. Let Him know your heart. Ask Him to change you and to grow you and to to help you throughout life and your friends. Third, fellowship with believers fellowship with believers. Get around people who are going to point you to the good news of the gospel, who care not just about LeBron James and where his son is going to play basketball in college, okay? I don't know where he's going to go play. Again, I think he's just riding his dad's coattail. Uh, But get around believers. Get around believers. Abide in the love. Fourthly, share the gospel with unbelievers. Right, this might sound a little weird. How in the world do I abide in Christ by sharing the gospel with un- unbelievers? We're going to cover this this summer. But I would imagine that for a lot of you in this room, and this is okay, my first summer project, I was in the same spot. When the idea of I'm going to go talk to someone about Jesus Christ who doesn't want to hear it, that might sound like the most terrifying thing to you on planet Earth. Okay, And that was me all the way back in 2015. But I can promise you this some of the most joyful, fulfilling times of my life have been when I'm sharing the gospel with people. When me and Austin do a Bible study with the baseball team at UIS, I leave that thing every single week just joyful. I don't even know what happens, right? We're just there leading the Bible study, talking about the word, we leave. But it's like, man, I just got to share the gospel with these guys. There's just something about it. It's just like, man, this is what I was created for. 
This is why we're here. God designed us to do this, to be his messengers, to be his ambassadors, and it helps us to love him and abide in him. So those are the four quick things. And so then ultimately, real quick, what does this produce in your life? What happens if you abide in Christ? Check out verse 11. I just said verse 9 is one of my favorite. You'll hear that from me a lot. I have a lot of, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Verse 11 is up there. These things I have spoken to you. That's one of my favorite phases, uh, phrases in the Bible. Phases. Phrases. Here's why. He literally tells us why he just wrote it. Sometimes we're always like, wow, what the heck does this mean? He tells us right here. These things I have spoken to you. Why? So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Christ offers us abundant joy. Psalm 1611, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, says this. See? You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What's the point? God is the source of joy. Sin, the world, is just deceiving you, is what the Bible says. It promises joy, but it can't fulfill it. God is the source of joy. And that's what everyone's after at the end of the day. What does everyone want in life? They want to be happy. They want to have joy. And God is saying, the way to have joy is by abiding in me, by coming to me, the fountain of living water, for to abide in. The key to doing this is consistency, not quality or quantity. We, we, we want to be consistent, trying to grow in our relationship with God, trying to abide in Christ. Here's an illustration that really helped me. Imagine for a second with me that I decided that for the rest of my life, here's my plan for food. On Sunday mornings, I'm going to go to Golden Corral, okay? And I'm going to measure out how many calories I need for the week. And I'm going to eat all of the food I need for the entire week Sunday morning, okay? A couple people nodded their head yes. I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? How do you think that would go? Pretty, the guy in the back said, great. I want you to go try that and see what happens. It would be horrible, okay? You'd probably throw up multiple times while you're trying to get all your food down, okay? Um, and then even if you got it all down, right, when do you think you would be hungry again, even if you did that? Probably that night. Let's just be straight up honest, right? Or maybe not that night, but the next day or Tuesday. You think you'd make it till next Sunday without being hungry? There's no way. You go do it, right? There's no way, right? It doesn't work like that. That's not how food works. And food is our earthly way that we live. And spiritually, the way that we live is abiding in Christ. It's not enough just to come to church on Sunday and expect that we're going to grow spiritually. It's not enough just to read our Bible once a week for eight hours and hope that that's going to make it through the whole week. No, we need to consistently be abiding with Jesus. I'm not talking about anything crazy. This is why we have the binder. There's devotional material. Most of those, the stuff in there is like one or two verses a day. It's just being consistent, eating, so that way it can nourish you. Our pastor, Pastor Gary, a few sermons ago, said something really insightful. He said, you do not remember every single meal you've ever ate. Okay? Really insightful. Okay? I mean, we've eaten thousands of meals, and you only remember like a handful of them, the ones that are just like extra good, you know, like Darcy's or something like that. Okay? You remember every time, right? But most of the meals you just forget. But those meals have sustained you, They've grown you, and they've caused you to get to where you are today and have given you life. Same thing is true with abiding in Christ. Just because you abide with Him, in the, that doesn't mean there's going to be instant growth, instant change, like noticeable. But I promise you, you'll look back 10 years from now and be like, wow, I can't believe how much Christ has grown me as I've consistently been abiding in Him. And so kind of in way of conclusion, um, abiding with Jesus, it really is essential to life. I hope you see that. There have been seasons in my life where I haven't, as a believer, since I've come to Christ, where I haven't abided well with Christ. And in those seasons, if I'm being honest with you, that's where I experienced a lot of sadness, a lot of anxiety. I went back to some sin. I was depressed. I was empty because I wasn't abiding with Christ. But then I can look back on seasons of my life where I did abide with Christ consistently. I think back to my very first summer project, just like this, but it was in Tampa, Florida. Sorry, we're not in Florida right now, okay? But it was in Tampa, Florida. And that summer, for the first time in my life, I abided with Jesus more consistently than I ever had. And I just grew like a weed in my backyard, okay? Our weed is like half backyard, or my backyard is half weed, okay? 
But I grew just tremendously, just tremendously that summer. And I didn't do anything crazy. I really didn't. I just got up and read a tiny little devotional, just like in this binder every day. I put myself around other Christians. I spent time actually praying every day. Again, I'm talking like five, ten minutes in the morning. And God changed me and grew me tremendously. And so I would encourage you this summer to abide in Christ. My prayer is that all of us this summer would make a priority. What would it look like? What would your life look like? What would my life like look like? What? I gotta stop talking soon. <laughs> what would my life look like if I really did consistently abide with Jesus this summer? I can promise you it'll look different and it'll, it'll look a lot more like the fruits of the Spirit, right? And so that's my prayer for you guys. And so now we're gonna take a, a quick five minute bathroom break and then we'll come back in here, okay? So five minute bathroom break starting right on the dot at 7.30. It's 7.24, 48 seconds. So you actually have five minutes and 10 seconds. Again, like I said, we're gonna be doing multiple things this summer and every week I won't even give a talk just like that, but every week we'll do some kind of a training. Uh, so we'll equip you in some kind of tool, some kind of diagram, something like that to help you either grow in studying the word, grow in your prayer life, grow in sharing the gospel, or understanding how to fellowship better. Okay, and so tonight I'm going to teach you guys something called the wheel diagram. Okay, so what I want you to do, uh, your very last section of your binder should have blank pieces of paper. If you don't have blank pieces of paper, there's paper right here. Okay, so um, who doesn't have paper? One, two, the people in the back. Pass that along. Anybody else need paper? Dylan, I don't think you have blank paper. I'm sorry. Just, just get a notebook or something. All right. So you're just kind of going to follow along with me as I draw this. Um, so imagine that this is like a whole sheet of paper, okay? So you can draw it like true to size, okay? So there's gonna be nothing in addition. Um, so you're gonna see this this summer as well. I am in fact an excellent artist and you will see that here in a second, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna draw because you might be like, what the heck is that? A circle, okay? So we're gonna draw a circle kind of around the whole page. I ran out of ink. That actually was pretty good. All right. All right. Everybody, everybody got that. I know that was tough. Okay. Nice big circle. Okay. In the middle, you can draw a circle about that size. I, I mean, it could be a little bigger, I guess, but that's what happened. Okay. About that, that big. Okay. And what you're going to do is I call them spokes. You're gonna draw four spokes, you'll see it in a second, that look like this. Kind of like a Pokemon ball if there's also vertical ones. Okay, so it looks like that. Okay, so what this is, it's called the wheel diagram, and the purpose of this diagram is to help you guys abide in Christ. Okay, so how do I abide in Christ? I gave you kind of a clue. I gave you the four things, okay? But we're gonna cover how do we actually practically do this? What does it look like? This tool is so helpful to me. I still use it all the time. When things aren't going well in my life, when I start to experience a lot of anxiety or anger or sadness or emptiness or whatever, I always go back to this and I check this and I'm like, all right, what's going wrong? And usually I can diagnose it just by looking at this wheel. Okay, and so it starts off with the center circle. Okay, at the center of our life as Christians, what has to be at the center of our life? Jesus. Okay, good. Jesus. Next week, we're going to talk all about what does it mean that we are united to Christ? That's what that center circle is all about. What does it mean that we're in Christ? That has to be the root or the motivation of why we do all the things I'm about to say. Because if it's not the root, you'll burn out. And also, you, I don't know. I don't know what else. It just won't work, okay? Right? Because you can't do anything apart from Christ. So Jesus has to be the center of your wheel, okay? And now, for the vertical spokes, there's two things that we do, think vertically, with God. What are the two things that we do with God? Pray, okay? Pray. 
You can write it however you want. I just write it like that. What's the other thing we do? We study the word. Okay. We study the word. Okay. Those are the two things that we do with God. Okay. Now it's going to be a little trickier, but think really generally. Now think, if that's vertical, there's two things we do horizontally with other people, okay? With, with people around us. And the two categories are, there's one thing that we do with believers, and the one thing we do with unbelievers. Does anybody want to take a stab at the unbeliever one? Evangelize. Good. Evangelize is a fancy church word for share the gospel. Evangelism, okay? This one's going to be a little trickier, but I'm sure you guys can get it. Just I, there's many words you could use, but what's a kind of a biblical word for what we do with believers? Fellowship. Fellowship. Good. I forgot I gave them to you already. You all answered that too fast. Fellowship. Okay. So the purpose of this wheel is to help us remind us, kind of orient our life. If we want our life to go smoothly, if we want our life to roll along, okay, it's a wheel, okay. All of the center and the spokes need to be fully functioning, right? They need to be good to go. What would happen, imagine if a wheel really looked like this, okay? But imagine if a wheel really did look like this and we took out this spoke and this spoke, okay? How would the wheel roll? Terribly, okay? Terribly, very bumpy. Uh, it, would, it would not be smooth. It would not be rolling as it was designed to, right? And that's the purpose of this wheel. How do I abide in Christ? I'm trying to orient my life around kind of these things. And if I'm abiding in these things, growing in these things, again, not perfectly, not like, oh man, like I got to read, I got to pray for four hours a day, right? It's like, I got to go tell 800 people about Jesus before the night ends, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about progressively. I'm trying to grow in these things and roll forward. Your life will go according to how Christ wants it to, which is to bear fruit. Right? So we, if we do these things in our life, we will bear fruit. Okay? And so here's what we're going to do. Okay? It's 7.35. That's good. So you have 15 minutes. Okay? I want you to just kind of group up with the people around you, maybe like three people in a group, two. I don't, I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. Okay? Just the people around you. And what you're going to do for the next 15 minutes is to try to find as many verses as you possibly can for each of these spokes. Okay, don't worry about the center yet. We're going to cover that. That's all next week, okay? So just the spokes. The way I do it, just for clarity, because I get confused, is I just draw like little arrows so I know like, okay, everything in this quadrant is all the prayer verses. And then like everything in this quadrant is all the evangelism verses. Does that make sense? Right. So I'll give you, I'll give you one to start. Prayer. Psalm 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who built it labor in vain. Unless the, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Right? Unless we go to the Lord, unless he does it, we can't do anything. So we have to pray. Okay? So now break into your groups the next 15 minutes and try to find as many verses as you possibly can to fill up your wheel. Ready to go. All right. Okay, I have your attention. Okay, so now what we're going to do for just five minutes, okay? We're gonna kind of go just around the room. So once you share one, wait a second, let some other groups share one, okay? And so I'm gonna ask, you can pick anyone that you want to share one with the group so I can write it up here on the board. So that way you can be like, oh, I didn't have that one. You could jot it down as well, okay? So who wants to go first? And I'm gonna ask you to read the verse as well out loud. So that way, if you're just like really off, I could be like, eh, I don't know if I'm gonna put that up there, all right? So who wants to go first? Which one? Um, we're going to do evangelize. All right. And we have Matthew 28, 19. What does that say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good. So You're good. And 20. Great verse. Who wants to go next? Don't be shy. You're all going to have to go. Elodie. Good. First Thessalonians 5.17. Good. Who's next? Yep. Hit me. Yep. Okay. 
119.105. Good. That's a good one. What else? Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Okay, good. What else? Yep. Um, the fellowship. Yep. John 4, 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Good. What else? Yep. Um, for evangelism. Yep. It is 21, 13, and it goes down to 18, I think. Okay. Good. Who's next? Yeah, hit me. Um, eight, Which category? The, oh, sorry. Um, it's for words. Okay. Um, it says, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna and food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did this, um, he did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Amen. Parallel passage to that, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Good. What else? Bethany. Good. What else? Yep, Cade. Uh, for fellowship. Yep. Uh, Proverbs twenty seven seventeen. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Good. What else? Yep. Philippians four, six through seven says for, Okay. Um, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. Good. What else? Bree. Um, under evangelism, yep. Good. Table of all guys over there hasn't said anything. Austin. Okay. Good. Any others? There's four and four. Let's get one more evangelism, one more fellowship. Who's got it? Yeah. One for evangelism? Yep. Uh, Romans 10, 14, and 15. Good. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never seen? Good. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That's good. A good one. Last one, Elodie. Good. Anybody just have like a dying one that they want to add on there? Like I just can't go to sleep tonight if I don't add it for the group. All right, let me try to add one for everyone that I don't see on here. Fellowship, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Can someone read that for us? Yeah. Who said yeah? Let us consider how to stir each other up to loving good works, not neglecting to move together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. You had it memorized and you didn't say it? Prayer. Let's do James five sixteen. Someone read that. Whoever's got it, you confess, confess your offenses to one another and pray for another for one another that you may be healed. The offenses for a righteous person is powerfully effective. 
Good. Uh, evangelism. Let's do. It's not up here. Um, Acts one eight. Who's got that? Why are you laughing, Bella? <laughs> oh. Excuse me, back there. <laughs> Who's got Acts one eight for me? Yeah, hit me. Well, don't hit me. Just read it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all in Judea and Samaria and, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Good. The word. John. Fifteen seven. Who's got it? Um, yep, go ahead. Um, John fifteen seven. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Good. I like that your translation literally says remain. So that's literally what abide means, so that's cool. All right. All right, good stuff. You can literally do this forever, okay? Well, that's not true. You literally couldn't do it forever. But you can do it for a long time, okay? <laughs> you can do it for a long time. And the point of this, the reason we wanted to do this, I wanted you guys to find it for yourself, is because I don't want you at any point in your entire life, not just this summer, to just listen to someone up front and be like, that person's telling the truth, okay? I, I, I'm trying to tell you the truth. I I'm not trying to deceive you, okay? But at the end of the day, we have to always go back to God's word. We have to search the scriptures for ourselves is what it says in Acts 17, 11. We got to examine the scriptures to see if these things are so, right? So when people say things, go to the word, see if it matches up with what they're saying. And so clearly the word has a lot to say about these four things in our lives, which would mean that they are important, that we should do them to be abiding in Christ. And so the goal this summer, the reason we started with this is to try to grow in these four areas and then plus union with Christ, which we'll cover next week, okay? We're trying to grow in these four areas so that way we would abide with Christ, that our life would roll along smoothly, and that we would bear fruit, and that our joy would be full, right? By abiding in Christ, our joy is full, okay? Any questions? Good. All right. Okay, so a couple announcements before we get out of here. Okay, the first announcement is this take advantage of the devotional material, okay? All of the verses every single week match up with the theme, okay? Alana and I and Oliver in the nursery for about three hours one day a few weeks ago sat down and tried to brainstorm all the verses for every week. Uh, you'll benefit from it, I promise you. Again, none of them are many. If you look at the first week with me, today's was literally what we just covered. Tomorrow is the back half of what we just covered. And then the rest of it is just a few verses here or there. Psalm 1 is six verses, right? So take advantage of it. Abide with Jesus consistently. Eat the word and see what happens in your life. As you'll see on that opening page, there's also a scripture memory. So there's going to be a scripture memory verse for every single week, okay? If you memorize all of the verses for all eight weeks, you get something, okay? I don't know what it is yet or how amazing it's going to be, okay? But you'll get something if you memorize all eight verses for the week. We want to store up God's Word in our heart and then take advantage of the articles as well, okay? The next thing is, who's ever heard of the app called GroupMe? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, good. That actually made that way easier, okay? So, true story. So, I used to work for a ministry at Southeast Missouri State University. Uh, that's where I came to Christ. And then after I graduated, I went on staff with the college ministry there. That ministry is also now called Campus Movement. That's cool, okay? But the point is, when I was there, when I left last May, so I've been in Springfield for about a, a year, we had group me's galore. I mean, just everywhere. Like, it was just sickening, okay? And the first, I'm not, the first thing I did when I left was delete group me. Just got rid of it. I was like, this is the greatest feeling of all time, okay? <laughs> but I'm bringing it back, okay? It's back, it's been gone for a year, and now it's time again, okay? And so I'm gonna make a group me for the summer 4217 project, okay? So if you signed up, we already have your phone number, okay? And we're gonna add you to the group me. So if you don't have the app, download the app, so that way we can just communicate with you guys, okay? Here's the reason group me is terrible, and you probably know this, okay? It's like a couple things. Memes, okay? Yeah. Okay, memes. Uh, things that have nothing to do with 217 Project, okay? 
like check it out i just ate a hot and spicy mcchicken from mcdonald's it's like what is it well cool like i mean that's great you should have got me one but like don't post it in the group okay things like that that's what makes it terrible okay but we do it, it'll be helpful it'll be helpful so we can hang out with one another this summer it's like hey we're all gonna go bowling Karina's is going to take us all out to scoop du jour right things like that okay that we can post in the group i can remind you guys about things that we'll be doing this summer remind you about the trainings you can ask questions you could post in there about the devotional that you read things of that nature okay so we're going to add you all to a group me with that being said if you haven't signed up for project and this is your first time you haven't signed up online is what i mean checking in was not signing up that was just checking in if you haven't signed up online okay and you want to keep coming back for the summer i hope that I didn't scare you away, okay, with my stumbling over my words towards the end, right? We want you to come back. We hope you'll enjoy this, but we would ask that you would sign up just so that way we can get a head count. So we can get a head count so we can know who to expect, how often to expect you, and then if you want a binder, that we'll be able to get a binder to you, okay, for next week, okay? We, if you get signed up, we will get you a binder for next week. Um, and so go talk to my wife uh, at the check-in table. Uh, on there, there's a little QR code that you can scan and sign up. You can literally put in there like how many weeks you're gonna miss, uh, things of that nature if you want a binder. But sign up for us just so we know and that we can get you a binder for next week. Um, does that make sense? Yep. Yes. All right. Was this, do you all enjoy this? Was this cool? Yes. All right. All right, cool. Well, the guy from Texas gave two thumbs up. So uh, that's cool. All right, well, let me pray for us. I'm glad you guys all came. Um, to be honest with you, this exceeded my expectations. Um, this is, I mean, this is far more people than we thought would be here, which is amazing. And so we pray that God would use this tremendously in your guys' life this summer, and that you would grow in relationships with one another as well. So let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have made it abundantly clear the importance of abiding in you. Father, we pray that we would do that this week, that this summer, that we'd make it a top priority in our lives to abide with Jesus. God, just as most of us can't even fathom skipping a meal or, or going a day without eating, Father, so would you change us that we couldn't even fathom not abiding with you, not getting in your word, not talking to you in prayer, not uh, fellowshipping with believers, and not looking for opportunities to share the gospel with unbelievers. Would that be who you change us to be? So we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for tonight. It's been a blessing, God. We pray that everyone would uh, be safe this week, Father. We pray that you would help them to grow. We pray that they would all come back this next week, Father, and that we would study what it means that we are in Christ and the blessings that come with being in Christ. So God, we love you. Pray this in your name. Amen.